But the African record on this is very poor, is that, is that authoritarians do even worse uh, than Democrats. De democracy might be very messy, but it's undoubtedly a more stable system. Are democracies more likely to experience economic growth? I posed this question to Dr. Greg Mills of the Brentos Foundation in a recent episode of my podcast, Solutions with David Ansara. What follows is a short extract from our longer conversation. If you would like to watch the full discussion with Greg Mills, you can do so by clicking on the link in the description below. Enjoy. A great expression by um, Bobby Wine, the Ugandan reggae artist turned politician. And I've done a, a song with Bobby on, on this book. Um, and, and the reason why I sort of drew together with him was I heard what he had said to the Americans when he was asked by, uh, about um, what the United States should be doing in Uganda to try and create a different political atmosphere. And he was, of course, being confronted and challenged by the repressive nature of the regime and his supporters were being attacked and so on. And he said, well, just don't fund our oppressor. And the song we've written is Don't Pay Our Oppressor. Um, and, and I think that's also a key measure of aid expenditure, which is to simply do no harm. So it's not just about trying to find ways to do good. It's also about finding ways to do no harm, to, to stop upending local systems and pathways to develop and progress because of your own instincts or ideas coming from outside as to how these things should operate uh, and stop reinforcing bad practices in your strategic interests. And I guess the one country I look at in this book, which is one that I spent a lot of time on uh, a decade ago, is Rwanda. So, you know, the presumption is uh, that Rwanda is an exceptional example of development, um, but we don't really understand the political consequences of supporting what is effectively a minority regime uh, in Rwanda, uh, which displays acute authoritarian tendencies. Anybody that's elected with 99% of the vote, you know, tends to set off warning flags and flares um, and should do. Uh, um, but we see it as an exceptional example of the benefits of, of aid expenditure, the benefits of stability, but the counterfactual should be asked as to, you know, would it be growing at a higher or lower rate without uh, this authoritarianism? And are we simply reinforcing a practice of, of autocracy rather than uh, you know, trying to encourage a more democratic system, which is undoubtedly more stable? And that's another one of the features of the book that we, we look at, that I look at, which is you know, the relationship between democracy and development. And there's this growing empirical body of evidence to suggest that countries that are Democratic are less volatile, grow faster, um, and because of the absence of volatility, tend to have a much greater compounding effect of growth. And so it's hard to encourage those conditions and stop trying to celebrate the exceptionalism of one or two rather dodgy analytical examples, Rwanda, Ethiopia, of course, which has been shown to have no clothes, to misquote the old expression, um, uh, because of its absence of democracy largely, um, and, and trying to understand thus aid as a political uh, um, phenomena and the way in which it can influence political events is absolutely key to understanding the process of development. So I guess uh, that follows to my next question is the, the role of security issues. Um, we've spoken about economic liberalization. I think uh, we should definitely look at the role of the private sector in driving growth and prosperity. That's very important. Uh, but none of that really matters if your country is engulfed by a civil war um, or has been uh, you know, invaded by a foreign country, as we've seen uh, with Ukraine now. Uh, so do you think that there's a, a kind of a sequencing issue there, focusing on security and stability first and then the economic liberalization? Or do you think that those two things go hand in hand? Well, I do believe that uh, security has a benefit all of its own. And I think you do need to have security. It's a it's of course a chicken and egg question. You do get security from inclusive development or do you get security from keeping a lid tightly fastened down and gradually releasing it over time? The African example, if you look at military coups and the effects 
of military coups is of a very detrimental effect of, of trying to do the security first approach. There are exceptional cases, Rwanda is one of them, um, but generally speaking, military regimes, which have followed this idea of doing security for, first, um, military regimes have been particularly poor at development, uh, in spite of the fact that they seemingly have all these levers of control at their disposal. And they tend to belie the whole authoritarian dictator or benevolent dictator, sorry, um, terminology uh, or, or concept uh, where you have a strong man that has a sort of light touch, a relatively light touch, um, uh, and that they are able thus to, in a kind of East Asian tradition, be able to push forward development decisions in a way that doesn't take uh, into account all the parliamentarian and other niceties of, of governance. But the African record on this is very poor, is, is that authoritarians do even worse uh, than Democrats. De democracy might be very messy, but it's undoubtedly a more stable system. And, and we've seen in Africa the advantages of democracy, as I mentioned, through the empirical correlation between democracy and, and development. If you look at the categories of Freedom House outlines between unfree, partly free, and free, the freer the country, the better the performance outcome in Africa. And if you strip out those countries which are single commodity producers, the, 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 the gap between the free and the, the other categories gets even wider. And that's because the freer the country, the more likely you are to, to invest in diversified industries. You don't have to be that, you know, things, for, you know, for instance, in things you dig out of the ground or pump out of the ground, you don't have to be there just for those reasons. You can be there for other good reasons where you could be investing in a country X in Africa or country Y in East Asia in the same set of industries because your investment is secure. So there is a, a connection between democracy and good governance. Um, uh, and that seems to, to indicate that uh, the sort of military approach to providing security alone uh, is insufficient. And certainly in the case of a country like, like Ethiopia, eventually, if you don't have this inclusive political uh, approach, um, you end up basically replicating a sort of version of minority rule, which we know only too, uh, we're only too aware of in, in South Africa, of how unsustainable that is and how immoral that is. Um, and you end up you know, replicating that, albeit in a in a different uh, ethnic context in in other in other places. So, you know, the problem in Ethiopia really stemmed from the Tigrayans, which are about six seven percent of the population, uh, through Mela Sanawi and through their victory in the war against the Derg of Mengistu, um, having a disproportionate impact on control over and benefit from um, the the. Ethiopian uh, state uh, and, and all the proceeds that went with it. And that was extremely resented by other majority groupings, the Amara and the Roma among them. And you, it set the stage for an increasing dysfunctionality, particularly after Meles died. And that sort of iron grip was attempted to be relaxed by his successor, Haile Miriam Deseling. Uh, and then you, you, know, you have what you have today, where you have uh, a somewhat uh, haphazard uh, a rule of, of Abbey, um, who, albeit being filled with messianic certainty, um, you know, hasn't proven to be as politically adept as managing all these different internal strains. And in fact, has been quite crude in his approach, particularly towards the Tigrayans, which has resulted in this war. So, you know, we, we, we tend to make the assumption that countries are a, an example of how, you know, this benevolent dictator, which for me is an oxymoron anyway, but the sort of idea of a benevolent dictator works and we would take a fixed moment in history. But when you look at a longer sweep of history, it, it looks like a far more shaky concept, uh, particularly when you look at the relative performance of, of African democracies. But then that automatically brings us to the point, 
is how do you encourage greater democratic behavior? Now, what we had in Africa. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this conversation, you might want to check out the full discussion with Greg Mills. That's linked over here. You can also subscribe to my other channel. That's linked over here. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.